Very good Saturday evening. Welcome. This is the weekend edition of Primetime News. We are coming to you live and direct this evening from a news for studios in Colombo. I'm Joel Outskun. Let's start off today with a look at our headline making stories. India aims to venture into the Palali airport. Bimal Ratnayaka reveals the reason behind former president's visit to Singapore. Politicians comment on the proposal to increase the salaries of MPs. Neurologists brutally attacked by students adjacent to the Peradeniya University. The people are smashing coconuts, seeking the elephant of the Devala is returned. Where is the elephant? This elephant is missing from the Devala premises. If Chandana Katriyarachi says he takes responsibility, you have the person who took it. If it was given for Perahara's and events, it should be there. We start off with a look at our top story this evening. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe says India will support the development of the Palali Airport. Vikramasinghe made this comment at the opening of a new building at the engineering faculty of the Kilinochi University. Palali will become an internet, uh, airport of international status where we can have flights coming in from uh, India and from Malaysia. Because we will develop it, we won't go beyond the extent we will have to take new land but with the existing land in two stages Indian government is helping us. Similarly, Kankasanthure will be developed and expanded as a port. So these are two big areas. We are looking at the Kankasanthure uh, cement plant to, be, to become remove and for that to become an area for light industry and for IT and another one which will be started in Parantan. We are starting a series of coal stores uh, for coal storage in, throughout the country. The first one is in Dambulla and some of them will be here in this area. We are looking at vast lands which can be used for coconut cultivation as coconut trees come down in Gampaha district and in uh, Kurunagala. We have to replace them in other areas. Well, there appears to be a rising trend of handing over national resources and strategically important points in the country to foreigners. The attempts to have over the uh, Matale Airport, which is known as the world's emptiest international airport to India, could be cited as one example of this trend. The Indian Minister of State for Civil Aviation, Jan Singha, made a statement to the Indian Parliament noting there is no proposal under consideration for the Airports Authority of India to buy a controlling stake in the Matale Airport. However, Sri Lanka's Minister of Civil Aviation, Nimal Siripala de Silva, said talks on the project are progressing with India. This will be developed as a joint venture and there is a proposal for that. They want to establish a company under this joint venture where 70% will be purchased by the Indian Airport Authority and that money will be used to pay off the debt. We will not allow the airport to be used for any military or air force activity. The India-based Hindu newspaper reports that both sides have held several rounds of discussions over this project. The Hindu reports that India will operate the airport on a 40-year lease as per the draft agreement. Accordingly, the two governments, after detailed negotiations, have agreed that India, with a 70% stake in the joint venture, will contribute 225 million US dollars to revamp and run the airport, while the Sri Lankan side will invest the balance. The Hindu newspaper also goes on to state that it is an open secret that New Delhi's strategic interest in running the airport located near the China-controlled port in Hambantota outweighs commercial considerations. What is the use of having a government if they continue to lease out national resources to foreign nations, citing various promises? The central bank had announced that it had secured a one billion US dollar syndicated loan from China. Governor Indrajit Kumaruswamy said that the first half of the loan will be released later this month and the balance will be received in October. The recorded reserves was 8.4 billion US dollars. I mean, we went up to close to 10 after the international sovereign bond issuance. Uh, um, but there have been payments since then. We think we'll finish the year. Uh, with about 9 billion US dollars. From 8.4 billion, um, 1 billion um, dollars will come in on the syndicated loan in two tranches of 500 million, um, 
one in August and the other in uh, uh, October. Uh, if everything goes well, there should be one more IMF tranche of 250 million, and we are working towards uh, a panda bond issuance before the end of the year. We went on a non-deal roadshow to China, uh, and there seems to be a good interest, and perhaps uh, most encouraging of all was our meeting with the People's Bank of China, their, their central bank, uh, where the um, deputy governor, totally unsolicited, uh, suggested that we set up a joint task force to examine how uh, Sri Lanka could explore the panda, panda bond market. Maybe about 250 million. So we are, trying, we are working towards finishing that this year. So there's about 1.5 billion to come in. There are payments, of course. Uh, so we think on balance we'll be close to 9 billion, which is a reasonable uh, number to have. So both in terms of price stability and in terms of external viability, we think we are in a reasonably comfortable place. This country is being auctioned off at present. It would be better if this country is handed over to professional auctioneers like Shockman and Samar Vikrama. At least they would announce it and do the auction, but now they sell it in the secrecy of the night. Whoever is elected leader, we will not let them play around. We obeyed everyone from 1948. We will not allow this game to continue. <laughs> The February 27, 2015 bond auction sparked controversy. Speaking in Parliament, the Prime Minister said he insisted on the change in the bond issuance system and speaking to News First before that, Arjun Mahindran confirmed what took place and he takes responsibility for it. This led to investigations being carried out by the Gamini Pitapana Committee of which the members were all UNP loyalists and the Committee on Public Enterprises. While the February 2015 bond auction was the hot topic at the time and led to serious debate, a second controversial bond auction took place in March 2016, especially the 29th of March. At these auctions, Perpetual Treasuries Limited blatantly flouted public trust and showed no respect to the public and the public money. The amount accepted by the central bank at this auction was seven times greater than the amount accepted in 2015. During the investigation, the Presidential Commission of Inquiry came to the conclusion that former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahindran had acted wrongfully, improperly, mala fide, fraudulently and in gross breach of his duties as Governor of CBSL at the bond auction. The Commission of Inquiry states it is necessary to ascertain the method by which Perpetual Treasuries Limited made the phenomenal profits. Perpetual Treasuries Limited made a net profit of 5.124 billion in the financial year ended the 31st of March 2016 and a net profit of 6.365 billion in the financial year ended 31st March 2017. When it came to the 2016 bond issue, PTL obtained 34% and 31% of those bonds. Evidence led before the Commission unearthed phone conversations that are of paramount importance to the investigation. Especially the conversation Arjuna Loshis had with Kasun Pali Sen in the very morning the auction took place on the 29th of March 2016. It is clear in this call the PTL with inside sources had fixed the auction. Hi. Hi Arjun. Hi. So yesterday there was a meeting that was called okay. with all the state banks <coughs> and an instruction has gone that the state banks did low. Okay. Okay. So I found out from our friends at uh, NSV and our friends at BOC. Yeah. And they have not given a specification at what rate to build, but they want to build low. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay. Then there were other things. I'll give you a quick background. The other things that were mentioned was that basically a proposition to take the SRR out. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And certain other propositions basically to drastically bring the rates down after the 126 billion is raised. The actual number is 122, one not 126. Right? Okay. <coughs> so, that's the status. Now, there are few scenarios that's going to play out. Scenario 1, <coughs> the entire market is expecting a rate hike today. Yeah. 
that is not going to take place. <coughs> yeah. Okay? Yeah. Right. So our friends from the department yeah. are telling us, <coughs> if you can, why don't you all bid more today as opposed to Thursday? Because Thursday interest is going to be huge. The estimated immediate loss at this auction calculated as 784.898 million rupees. However, the long-term loss cannot be ascertained as the secondary market transactions of those bonds are not available. In addition to this, after the Bond Commission report was released, it was M.A. Sumandiran who postponed the debate on the central bank bond auction in Parliament, insisting on the Tamil translation of the report. The question that many have is, how does he not understand the content of the English report when he himself makes statements in Parliament in English? It would be best if the bond report is laid to rest prior to any future elections. It is now clear that the second controversial bond issue is far greater than the first and it is paramount that it is investigated. There is no denial to the fact that this was premeditated not only by Arjun Mahindran and Arjun Aloysius, but by those in powerful places. Still in news here at home, now Provincial Councillor Niroshan Paduka alleges that former Deputy Minister Chandana Khatriarachi is illegally keeping the elephant that belongs to the Pilyan de la Mampe Ganevata Devalaya. Nivoshan Paduka, as the chairman of the Mampe Ganewata Devala Development Foundation and several others, addressed the media on this matter and also engaged in a religious plea at the Devala premises. Chandrika Kumar Tunga Hitabu Janadi Patini. In 1995, former President Chandrika Bandar Nayaka Kumar Tunga donated an elephant calf to the Ganewata Devalaya. This elephant calf is missing from the Devala premises. It was donated to this Devala. When we made inquiries, we found out that Chandana Khatri Arachi is using the elephant for business purposes. We request Minister Sarat Fonseca as the Minister of Wildlife to return this elephant to the Devala. They have taken away all the documents pertaining to this elephant. He is using the elephant as if it is his personal property. The Department of Wildlife requested us to go to the Dehivala Zoo to inquire if they possess the documents. Those documents have also gone missing. The elephant goes missing and it was part of a conspiracy. This is an abduction. News was contacted former Deputy Minister Chandana Khatriarachi, who serves as the chairman of the Ganewata Dewala Development Committee on this matter. Who is the real owner of this elephant? A letter was addressed to me by the chairman of the Ganewata Dewala Development Committee for the Dewala Perahara. There is a development committee for the Dewala with over a 70 year history. I have been chairman of this committee for more than 23 years. If there were such allegations, one cannot remain as chairman for more than two years. If he is saying that Chandrika Bandaranaka gave the elephant, you have the person who gave it. You also have the person who obtained it. If the elephant was given for Perahara's, you have the elephant as well. No theft has taken place. Well, the decision taken to increase the salaries of MPs and ministers was a matter of discussion at various platforms today as well. We are not those who take anything for personal gain. After the cheque is deposited to the party fund, we are given the salary slip. They bring the salary formula for the president, prime minister and MPs. But that is not the case when it comes to the people of the country. A majority in this country keep voting for such a political trend. There is no such nation like this anywhere else in the world. There has been an increase of salaries in the judicial sector previously as well. But the MP salaries have not increased in parallel to that. It is the MPs who have continuously faced inconveniences. They never made requests. They never demonstrated and they never launched pickets. They took what was given and engaged in their work. MPs have not been given a salary increase since 2006. There are various parliamentary allowances. I am against the increase of salaries of anyone, not even the MPs. Everyone is facing difficulties. The people have started to speak about the MP salaries, forgetting about all the other issues. We rejected this proposal. They are attempting to conceal the largest financial crime, the bond scam, by creating new topics on a weekly and monthly basis. 
The salaries have not been increased and there is no such request. The salaries of judges in high courts and supreme courts have been increased. We have been told that Dinesh Gunawardana of the joint opposition has requested for an increase in the MPs and minister salaries based on an old precedent. This is not our request. This is a request from Dinesh Gunawardana who represents the joint opposition. <laughs> Those in government are making meaningless statements. It is the speaker who has the right to make the content of discussions public. You must ask this from the speaker. There was no discussion about an increase of MP salaries. Lakshman Kiriala from the government commented on a salary increase. Ajit Mana Peruma must be suffering from a mental illness to make such a statement. It was the leader of the house who made this statement in parliament. No final discussions have been reached. As per the law, everyone agreed to this at the party leaders' meeting. The final decision rests with the president and the prime minister. This was passed in 2006 during the administration of Mahinda Rajapaksa. The salary must increase parallel to the salary increase of a court of appeal judge. I am not aware of that. It was in the newspapers yesterday. They make increases at 115%. When it is for the people, they assume it is like taking away a piece from the president or the prime minister. When giving hikes, it is difficult for them. But when it is for them, they try to make use of it to the maximum. When requests are made to increase the salaries of the estate worker, public sector and private sector employees, they say no. As far as I am aware, the highest paid Prime Minister is in Singapore. They build their nation and enjoy. These MPs and ministers are enjoying while doing nothing. Now, while politicians made those comments speaking at an event in Polonnaruwa this evening, President Maitri Palasirisina said he will not permit the increase of salaries of the MPs. The newspapers, televisions and radio all reported on what is called the increase of salaries of the MPs and ministers. There was no owner for this when it was reported on the newspaper yesterday. But when you look at the Sunday edition of the newspaper, there is an owner for those statements. A minister had said that the party leaders decided there needs to be an increase of salaries of MPs, ministers and deputy ministers. I will not permit the increase of even a red cent for their salaries. Pakistan's Prime Minister in waiting, Imran Khan, has decided to keep volume of the Federal Cabinet Limited. And initially, the Cabinet will be of 15 to 20 ministers with high qualifications in the respective field, which also matches the positions they are to be given. Over in Canada, 15 women and 15 men from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's cabinet, which hits on all notes with a mix of experienced personnel holding recognized and high qualifications. In Singapore, with a population of over 5 million, 20 of the 22 cabinet ministers possess a minimum qualification of a post of graduate degree. By contrast, Sri Lanka, with a population of over 20 million, has a total of 92 ministers in the government. This includes 47 cabinet ministers, 20 state and 25 deputy ministers. What qualifications do these people possess to hold such responsible positions? News First will delve deep into this matter from tomorrow. JVP parliamentarian Bimal Ratnayaka speaking at an event in Munamal Denia, Panduwasura, made the following remarks. There was an uneasy situation as Mahinda failed to attend an event. Shamal says Mahinda had suffered a hip pain and only recently returned to the country after treatment in Singapore. He says, how can he come here? Some media did not report beyond that. But I must praise Sirius of telecasting what Mahinda had to say to the organizer of the event. We are aware that before Mahinda became Prime Minister, he did not even have money for any treatment even in Maldives, let alone Singapore. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksa commented on the measures taken by his administration with regards to the proposed Bikku Dialogue Act. 
This act was presented during my administration as well. I handed it over to the monks and stepped away because if I intervened, others would have interpreted it in some other manner. Since it was a matter that was favoured by the Mahanayaka and not favoured by the other monk, it was best for them both to get together and solve the matter. Police have launched an investigation over the assault on a neurologist on a road adjacent to the Peradeni University dormitory. Police said they have launched the investigation based on the complaint made by the neurologist stating that he was assaulted by university students. Last morning, the neurologist had parked his car close to the dormitory of the Peradeni University on the Hindagala Road and during that time, two men in a motorbike had arrived and threatened him. <laughs> I parked my car on the corner of the road which leads to the hostel. Two students came in a motorbike and asked why I had parked over there. They yelled at me and said parking in that place is prohibited. Then I stepped out to see if I had done any wrong. I told them not to trouble me. I disconnected the call and dialed 119. During that time, they had called more students, obstructing the road with motorbike and assaulted me. The university security came to my aid and took me away. The neurologist who was injured in this attack was immediately admitted to the Peradene General Hospital and was later discharged this afternoon. Police said eight students are involved in this attack. News first contacted the Vice Chancellor of the University of Peradene, Professor Upul B. Disanaika, on this matter. <laughs> Yesterday, a specialist doctor called me and said he was assaulted by a group while passing the University of Peradenia. He had gathered all the information regarding those attackers. We will be able to identify them via the police. He has some clear images and they will be exposed. The program to vest 181 projects to the public under the Pipidemupolo Narva District Development Program concluded yesterday. Now, a musical show to mark the program's conclusion was held at the Giant Dipura Weekly Fair grounds in Polo Narva under the auspices of the President. Several projects were implemented in the Polo Narva District under this development program, covering many sectors, including education, infrastructure, and health. A sum of 60 billion rupees was spent on the projects which were initiated with the contribution of the Tri Forces. The launch of the program was marked on the 1st of August by declaring open a two story building at the Divulang Kadavala Central College. 60 projects were vested in the public on the first day of the program. 60 more projects were declared open on the second day under the auspices of the President. Yesterday, 61 other projects were vested in the public. The conclusion of the PB Demopolo Naru District Development Program was marked under the auspices of President Maitri Palasiti Sena yesterday afternoon. Several popular musicians in the country took part and performed at the musical show held yesterday. The musicians were backed by the band of the Sri Lanka Navy. Well, what you witnessed was a collapse of a crane at a construction site. Fortunately, it did not happen in Sri Lanka. However, such danger-prone areas are located all over Colombo and its suburbs. Tower cranes are a very common fixture at any major construction site and they often rise hundreds of feet into the air. Construction crew used the tower crane to lift a wide variety of building materials. In Colombo alone, there are more than 20 tower cranes fixed to the ground. Ganga Rama, Kalpiti, Duplication Road. It is paramount that those who walk by these sites exercise caution when doing so. There could be a risk of those who are not even on the premises of the construction site. 
A tower crane is constructed adjacent to the building under construction, covering it at a 70 degree angle. When this is the case, those located at the remaining 290 degrees are at risk. The engineer is not vested with the responsibility over this. The responsibility lies with the contractor. What measures do the general public need to take in order to avoid any casualties? Let's assume one of the bolts in the crane comes loose. It could cost the life of a young child. If one believes that the tower crane is not up to standard, one could immediately file a complaint with the closest police station. Following such a process would see the temporary suspension of the construction. Another leg of the program to construct 25 chaitiyas across 25 districts in line with the 94th birth anniversary of former president, the late Ranu Singh Premadasa, took place in Vaunia today. The event was graced by Deputy Leader of the United National Party, Minister Sajid Premadasa. The foundation stone for the construction of a new chaitya at the Vaunia Mahakachi Kodiya Purana Gall and Biharia under the Sasunata Aruna program was placed by the minister. Those who said that the Sambuddha Sasana was in danger have used the people's money to build memorials for their parents. I have shown that I am commemorating my late father by contributing 1,125 chaitiyas to the Sambuddha Sasana. They could have used the money that flowed in to revive the fallen temples. They could have built the Dhamma schools. While children were being educated under trees, they built a presidential palace in Jaffna with a swimming pool and a gymnasium. They only wanted to protect their royal family and not the Buddha Sasana. Locals have been severely inconvenienced due to the dilapidated state of a road located in Mathara. Voice of the people. This is a road leading from Mathara to Valigama across the Varakapitiya area. As these roads had been in dilapidated state for a very long time, locals say commuting on this road has become a daily challenge. Five buses operate on this road to reach the Nidangala, Varakapitiya, Kotavila, Valihinda and several other surrounding areas. According to the locals, sand was filled into the potholes on the road as a temporary measure. However, those too failed and made the situation even more worse. The locals point out that some potholes are almost two feet deep. They have made countless pleas from the authorities to rectify the issue, but those pleas have fallen on deaf ears. Recently, the Mahanaik of the Malwada chapter had this to say to Minister Kabir Hashim. Like they are making expressways, the roads leading up to the villages have to be built. We see it on the media and we ask every day that the roads to be built. Is there no other way? Can't those be built without it being from the same electorate? If a road is to be broken, there needs to be some form of mechanism. There is no point of these officials being here. They have not laid tar on the roads in 25 years. Any month <laughs> of the people. Well, speaking at an event in Vaunia today, Inspector General of Police Pooja Jayasundara commented on the power of Sri Lanka. Sure, there won't be any extremism, nationalism or terrorism. The security has been ensured by the people of this country as human beings and as Sri Lankans. Under the Sri Lankans community act, under the Sri Lankan identity, Singles have a fair chance, Buddhists have a fair chance, Tamils have a fair chance, Hindus have a fair chance, Islamic have a fair chance. There is no grudge between us. There won't be any extremism, any terrorism in the future. We have taken all the possible measures to ensure the national security, as well as the prevention and solving of crimes and stop all the corrupt practices, including the police people. So this is what we are doing. We are doing our best and the people have understood today, I am being the Inspector General, I am really happy about it. I am really happy about it. The exemplary service done by the DIG Vanni, Mr. Dejabandu Telugu and his group and the community and the people of the community, the mayor, 
பாதி சபா சபாபதி வில்லன் சங்கமே த த கோவில் அண்ட் எவ்ரி பாடி எவ்ரி பாடி இஸ் கெட்டிங் கெட்டிங் டுகெதர் அஸ் எ டீம் திஸ் இஸ் தி பவர் ஆஃப் ஸ்ட்ரெngth திஸ் இஸ் தி பவர் ஆஃப் தி பீப்பிள் திஸ் இஸ் தி பவர் ஆஃப் ஸ்ரீ லங்கா திஸ் இஸ் தி பவர் ஆஃப் ஹியூமனிட்டி நீ மனுஷத்தி சக்தி ஆயி Minister of Higher Education and Cultural Affairs Dr Vijay Das Rajapaksha is speaking at the Kilinochi University today commenting on upgrading higher education By the end of this year when we open all the hostel buildings in our university network there will be an additional 33600 accommodations what had been constructed during 70 years is only 56000 but within last 2 years we have constructed for 36 33600 students the entire population student population is only 91000 that means more than 95% of the university students will get hostel accommodation by the end of this year we are bound to upgrade the standards of the university degrees In sports Sri Lanka's ODI captain Angelo Mathew says his team is well prepared for the third one day international against South Africa in Palikale tomorrow. Both teams took part in their final practice sessions today. Tomorrow's game which is scheduled to begin at 10 am is a must win for Sri Lanka to keep the series alive after having lost the first two ODIs in the five match series. Addressing the pre-match media briefing Sri Lankan skipper Angela Matthews commented on the impact the pitchers have had on the team's recent performances I mean we rely too uh, too much on our spinners if you look at the overseas teams they all play on good wickets I mean even if we go to South Africa yes they they use their home advantage against um, you know in test series but in the one day series if you look at all the opposition wherever you play they play on good wickets I mean in the past we relied on um the spinners too much which is not going to happen in you know in the future if you look at it we've scored only 3 times uh, passing 300 in the last 30 odd games we've not batted our 50 overs we've not um, um, you know got to more than 250 on on i would say four five three or four occasions so that also comes with the confidence because if if you want to play a shot and if you want to take that risk the wicket also has to be good and uh, on slow turning tracks it's it's never a easy task for the batters yeah these are normal one day wickets uh, we expect in the subcontinent it's uh, decent to bat on uh, and the, we expect the wickets to turn a bit so uh, you know our one day team we've played some pretty decent cricket over the last couple of years so yeah i, I like to think that we we playing good cricket no matter what wickets we we encounter well that's a wrap if you missed out on any stories log on to our board bin website triplew.newsfirst.lk i'm so lots good take care good night